Joe, how's it going? Great. How about yourself? Um, I'm exhausted. We've been uh, it's been doing a lot of different projects to, to get together, and we got another event to get to tonight. So as you know, we're yes. sort of shoehorning this event in. Yes. And uh, what are we, like 30 days out from the election? They keep track for me. I haven't heard the latest yeah, number. <laughs> I, I can't keep track either because my brain is damaged because I actually foolishly watched the entire debate between Donald Trump and Joe Biden last night. Well, I don't know what's worse, you watching the entire debate or me wanting to watch the entire debate but not being able to. Our um, Wi-Fi or our, our, our TV was down on the bus. And no, so I, I think, we got I to think see that part was a blessing. That was a blessing for you because <laughs> it was like watching two children fight over toys in a sandbox or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was kind of I was kind of sad for for our country and when I'm sad, I drink bourbon. So. Oh. I, did, did you see how smooth that, that, that <laughs> nice segue there that, that transition um, uh, I don't well yeah I usually don't drink bourbon because I'm sad I, I actually drink bourbon to celebrate and I don't know it just tastes good that's why yeah. um, in fact I teach a psychology class where I talk about uh, conspicuous consumption yeah and I show them a clip from 2020 which talked about uh, how vodka, by the way, I don't know if you know this, but according to 2020 anyway, on um, according to the federal government, vodka has to be tasteless, colorless, and odorless. So my thinking is, what's the point? Like, yeah. why would you have vodka if you could have bourbon? But oh yeah, because people drink to get drunk. I forget that. That's why other people drink. I do it because I love it. Yeah. I love the taste. <laughs> I'm with you. I don't, I don't dr ever drink vodka because I don't drink to get drunk. I right. drink because... Bourbon is beautiful. It's beautiful, and we drink beer and wine. I, I don't. I don't exclude. Yeah, no, fellow I, drinkers. Yeah, well, I don't discriminate against red wine during dinner. I will okay. often have red wine during dinner, and I gotta admit, I cheat on bourbon every now and then. If I go out to dinner and I see other people with the little umbrella drink, sometimes it's like, okay, I'll go over to the dark side this one time. That looks kind of fun, but okay. <laughs> but I'm, no, I'm, if you walk in my house, it's bourbon with a little gin because gin has flavor too. Sure. Why would why would the government decide that that alcohol can't taste like anything? Well, I'm, I think it's just that. vodka. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, the moral of the story is, you know, people are vodka snobs. <laughs> it makes absolutely no sense. <laughs> so I'm going to pour us a small bourbon. We awesome. still have to speak tonight, so we're not going to drink the whole bottle because I know just half. some people said. Half, we two could, thirds? Yeah, mm. we'll see how we get. <laughs> Luck, luckily, my campaign manager isn't here, so <laughs> But um, everybody else clear the room. <laughs> in In the meantime... I heard rumor that there is a Joe Jorgensen branded vodka. I'm giving you Darth Vader, and I don't know if that means anything, but oh. there it is. <laughs> I'm, um, yeah, I don't want to show my lack of libertarianness by, I, I, I have seen, I actually saw the movie in the 70s when it came out. <laughs> but, and, and I do know who Darth, Darth Vader is, so I guess that's, that's someone. Uh, someone suggested to me that Joe Biden, um, stridently saying i am this the, oh. the democratic party last night <laughs> sounded a lot like palpatine and and i i sort of see the resemblance okay so but i'm not i'm not going to drag you head. through star wars stuff okay. so so do Cheers. you do skull like <laughs> thank you what do you do for liberty well yeah for liberty perfect well my part of my family's from denmark and sometimes they do this danish little skull where they do this all i i'm I I'm not around my family enough to have learned it, but anyway. My friends but, in Iceland you. say skull. So skull. Yes, Denmark too. Oh, that's good. Yes, yeah, so <clears throat> maybe this shows that I'm kind of a bad mother here, but I I, I, I trained my daughter right to not drink vodka. <laughs> <laughs> and she was she went to Notre Dame to go to doctoral, um, to a doctoral I'm not you know I don't want to get into her personal life, but she comes back after Christmas, you know, for Christmas vacation. Mom, I got the best bourbon ever. And, and there's a kind of bourbon in uh, Indiana that's only sold in Indiana, although my family did find some for me, I think, in Wisconsin. It kind of seeps out. But I guess I can go ahead and say it. It's backbone. But so sometimes you just don't like put two and two together. And I got to admit, I was an ignorant bourbon drinker for a long time. I just knew what I liked. And it never occurred to me, oh, wait a minute, when you buy vodka, bourbon, whatever in the store, and it's 80 proof, 100 proof, whatever, it's like, how do they get it to be exactly that number? 
duh, they add water. And so my daughter <laughs> introduced me to um, uncut bourbon. And barrel strength. Yes, barrel strength, exactly, where it's got the little 115. And usually it's between 114 and 116. Yeah. And uh, so it's the stuff that people say tastes like, you know, cleans their car battery. But um, I love it. And yeah. so I somebody called them and said, by the way, did you know? And I don't know really the whole story how it happened. All I know is somebody called them, said, hey, did you know that you're the favorite bourbon? <laughs> and so they are making a Joe Jorgensen limited edition or something, and it's got my signature on it. So nice. it's, it still says backbone bourbon. It doesn't say, you know, libertarian bourbon or Joe Jorgensen bourbon, but it's got my signature. Maybe that's actually a more uplifting accomplishment than having been included in the debate last <laughs> night. I'm not sure. Maybe. But Maybe. I, I do want to talk about the debate, but uh, I want to start with the an article that I read in the Washington Post recently, and it was I don't even remember the name of the article, but it was about the sort of political divide in Rappahannock County, which is just yes. about an hour from Washington, D.C., and you have the, the Trump-supporting farmers versus the Washington transplants that have come in and, and set up like cappuccino houses and stuff like that. <laughs> and they're very offended by the Trump signs. And what, and, and, and that's an interesting argument and perhaps a metaphor for this, this fight that we seem to be in. But, yes. But the, the thing that shocked me about that article, and this is the Washington Post, um, one of the ladies she interviewed said, I'm voting for Joe Jorgensen. And they spelled your name right but they identified Unusual. you as a third party candidate. They couldn't say the word libertarian. Of course. And it struck me as a, like an editorial decision not to give right. your candidacy on all 50 state ballots right. any oxygen at all. <laughs> what's what's going on there? Yeah, well, uh, well we know that uh, the media are mostly Democrats. What, 92, 96% whatever poll you look at. And so of course they want to keep us out. And what's frustrating is I keep getting pegged as a third party candidate. And people don't realize that other than the Democrats and Republicans, we are the only party who have been on the ballot in all 50 states in back-to-back -back presidential elections. And we already had bad ballot access before then. But when they did it, you know, after we were on it again for the second time, uh, then the um, hoop got a little higher, a little harder to get through. So yeah. now it's really hard to get through. And so we keep um, being put with the other third parties, even though they're only on 20, 30 ballots. Yeah. And we're consistently on 50 ballots. It's as if they're afraid of something. Like, Gee, what is it think? about libertarians <laughs> that make Republicans and Democrats so nervous? Maybe it's because we're the only choice. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, we have to have a phony um, competition there among Democrats and Republicans because, you know, we can't look away from that fight because then we might see that really they're both on the same side. Yeah. There and, was so much name calling last night. And, uh, and part of that, that's, that's sort of Trump style. And I watch him do to, to Republicans. Um, Joe Biden did the same thing. But like the the theme that I heard again and again and again is don't vote for me because I stand for this, this, and this. Vote against right. that guy because he's <laughs> awful. And his people, the people who support him are awful. They just, they just want to keep us divided. Oh, yeah. And when I talk to people, I have a lot of uh, people that I meet who say, oh, I'm voting for you, but can you help me convince my friend? So my friend is just afraid that and then Trump's going to elect it. My friend's afraid that Biden's going to get elected. It's never, oh, my friend really likes Biden. I've never heard, I mean, dozens of times, my friend's afraid that whoever's going to get elected. And, you know, uh, uh, there, there's a myth out there that we tend to draw from one party versus the other. And we draw overall, we draw equally from both. And but but most of our votes do come from independents or people who have never voted. Yeah, so. it. I mean, I, I think most people that vote libertarian show up because they're voting for something. Oh. And if you took that choice away from them, they're just going to opt back out, and we end up in this cycle of, wow, every election cycle, our choices get worse and worse. The Republican and the Democrat, nobody's wanting to vote for either one of them, and the only solution, right, is to sort of break the duopoly and, and give somebody something to vote for. Yeah, well, I would say that 
the libertarians are voting against something, but it's different than the Democrats and Republicans because libertarians are voting against government. And in fact, I think sometimes that our message is almost too negative. You know, get rid of big government, get rid of spending, get rid of, you know, it's always what we're going to get rid of and not what we want. But the problem is, is we want so little from government yeah. that you can't put the benefits in terms of what you're getting from Washington. It's only in what we're getting rid of uh, in Washington. So <clears throat> we've got to go around and think how, okay, what can we provide that's good that we're not giving that yeah. they get by having the right to do it themselves? Yeah, we, we struggle to explain the, the beautiful things that happen when people are free because yep. we don't know exactly how it works. It's the <laughs> it's sort of that decentralized genius of people. And, a, and I look at the, the tribalism of of the Republicans and the Democrats and, you know, like, you know, vote for me because those guys, if they get power, they're just awful people. Mm -hmm. um, but no one seems to respect the genius of America, which is, is the, the power of the people to figure stuff out for themselves. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, just look throughout history. It's not, you know, and, and in fact, um, I've been getting a lot of questions about Facebook lately. And, you know, Facebook is so big. What are we going to do? You know, we got to get the government involved. And here, here's the nice thing about being an old timer is I can remember the olden days and, uh, you know, the Justice Department going after IBM. And I remember people saying IBM is so big, only the government can cut them down. And yet what they were uh, at war for, what, 13 years, something like. And they said that there was enough uh, paperwork generated to either go to the moon and go to the moon and back, I forget. Yeah. And yet the Justice Par Department did not cut them down. What, what really went after IBM, what finally cut them down was two guys out of their garage, Apple. So again, we've got the free market, we've got people having the freedom to start their own companies, to build their own products, and to do it without any government direction, without central planning. So again, people can do so much better than what the government could ever do. It's kind of like, that's the American ethos, is like, just yep. leave us alone and we'll figure it out. <laughs> yes. And uh, none of these guys want to leave us alone anymore. Let's talk about a couple issues that sure. they that they they did manage to touch on a couple things. And I know one issue that you're super passionate about is is environmental innovation mm -hmm. and sources of energy. If the government would just get out of the way, we could we could have a greener future, but Washington seems to screw everything up. Yeah, and one of the reasons why it's so frustrating to me is because there's so much misinformation about there. Uh, you know, out there. And one of the examples that I've used is, you know, people always point to the corporations as, you know, somebody needs to rein them in. And I've mentioned how, look at the Gulf oil spill. You know, people say, look, you needed government in there because corporations just go in and they just, you know, have oil spills and we're the ones left footing the bill. What they don't realize is that the government is the one that capped the liability, that in a free market, the insurance company would have had a profit motive to actually um, say, hey, we're going to come out and make inspections because, you know, we don't want to pay a claim. So the free market, the profit motive is going to be what helps the environment the most. And I just learned of a new case, and this is what's so frustrating too. And I, I guess what's really frustrating is that I think that, well, I know that the government has been one of the biggest problems in pollution, in the environment. And yet the people who care most about the environment, they're the ones going to government. And I just heard an astounding case. This was out of um, Montana. And there's a one, can I, can I name the organization? Sure. The Envi okay, it's PERC, P-E-R-C. Oh, I love those guys. I, yes, okay, I met two wonderful women who told me that there was a forest, beautiful forest, the timber company wanted to come by it, chop down all the trees, and the people around said, you know what? We kind of like the trees there. Uh, we'll put in a bid and we'll see if we can, you know, outbid the timber company. And they were shocked to find out that they did indeed outbid the timber company. And then they were like, uh-oh, now what? We got to raise the money. How are we going to raise the money? 
they actually raised the money in two weeks, which, by the way, doesn't surprise me at all because there are a lot of individuals, as you point out, individuals who care about the environment. Now, here's where the story turns ugly. They, they won. They raised the money. They got to keep the forest. But the legislature passed a law to prevent that from ever happening again. In other words, it's the government saying, no, we're going to let the corporations win out. And yet these people who are for the Green Party, who are, you know, for bigger government, they're turning to the very government that's hurting them. So I think that's why I'm so passionate, because it's like, why do you go to, you know, your, your torturer to uh, for help? Yeah. Um, it's, it's that sort of contradiction for, for people that... Um, this happens on a lot of things. It happens on on criminal justice. It happens on virtually every issue where oh, yes. where people people worry about some horrible social outcome. Yep. The the murder of Breonna Taylor, and I would use the word murder. Um, yes. But to me, it's a cautionary tale about a government that has too much power and little too little accountability. Um, so if you want justice for Breonna Taylor, you need to acknowledge that the government has too much power. Right. And, and yet the Black Lives Matter, the national organization, is Marxist, and they're asking for more government. Yeah. It's like, don't you realize they're the ones who caused it? And I think maybe when I was on your show before, I mentioned how Rosa Parks, you know, that was a government-run, government-owned bus. Why are you turning to the very people who caused it? Yeah, and, and there's the entire history of... Um, I, I actually like the word institutional racism because I think the mm-hmm. institutions mm-hmm. that in, reinforce racism are government institutions. Mm-hmm. And I think we should turn it back on them because that, that contradiction between people that, that passionately believe that black lives matter and therefore say we need to strengthen the size and scope of government. <laughs> right. I, don't, I don't get those two things because yes. government is the, is the problem here. And, the, and can I mention, yeah. I, was at, I was soundly criticized. I re- received a few angry texts and email. I, that's just to me personally. I know my campaign did. Well, actually, I was written up by a, an organization. Um, I pointed out how, uh, and you may have heard of this instance, where there is a woman working for a large company who on her personal Facebook put All Lives Matter. And the company said that they thought that that was tone deaf and that's not the image that they want for the company. And so they fired her. And keep in mind, that's her personal Facebook. She wasn't discriminating against an employee, a supervisor, a customer, anybody like that. And I pointed out as, see, this is how the free market works. You, you've got a company who's very sensitive about that, and they're going to respond because they've got the profit motive. Now, a lot of people are saying, yeah, but she shouldn't have been fired. Well, okay, if you believe that, then don't buy the product. You know, it's, it's and, and by the way, so many libertarians, you know, a lot of libertarians, uh, you know, maybe because we don't have a libertarian enclave right now, they, they, I think they mistakenly have the idea that the free market is always going to give them what they want. Well, you know what? Sometimes the free market doesn't agree with you. Right. And sometimes the free market gives you the wrong answer. But wouldn't you rather have the free market coming up with a decision than, you know, an elite few in, in um, Washington? So, uh, so the way the free market would work is then you don't shop from the company and then they go away. But it's still, it just shows that individuals care. It shows that companies care. And it shows that the federal government doesn't care. And that's a message that I've trying to been spreading or trying to spread. Yeah, it's, it's such a frustrating debate. And you saw it in the, in the presidential debate last night because, you know, Joe Biden immediately wanted to call Donald Trump a racist and then Donald Trump yelled back at him <laughs> and and Justin Amash I think has been pretty good on this because he's talked about all of the he, I don't know if he uses these words but both sides are virtue signaling to their bases right. about is it blue lives matter is it black lives matter is it is it the mask yeah the, <laughs> all of that stuff is in lieu of actually fixing the problem. That's a good point. And like libertarians have been talking about about reining in abuses of police power for a long time. We've been oh, talking yeah. about fixing the criminal justice system and no one's doing it. They're just they're just yelling. And unfortunately burning and looting and all the things that are happening, none of which leads to solutions. Yeah, in fact, 
that you bring up an excellent point. Uh, when I was in Florida a few months ago, I saw a Joe Biden ad where it shows him deliberately put, you know, like not just talking with a mask on. We want to make sure that you got the point. He's wearing a mask. And I, I swear that if he, they showed him putting on a mask like three times. It was ridiculous. It was yeah. like a mask here. And I hadn't thought about that, but that's absolutely right. It's like, hey, you know, this mask represents I can fix COVID. Yeah. 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 And like he, I'm surely Joe Biden knows that a president can't force everybody to wear a mask. It's, it's, I don't think he does know that. It's blatantly I unconstitutional, I but maybe, maybe that's a I, trait notion that the constitution I, would limit his power, but. Well, 1994 crime bill. I mean, he he does like authoritarian power. I yeah. I, I actually think he thinks he can do it. Yeah. I'm I'm I wish I wish I thought. Usually, I do attribute things to ignorance as opposed to dishonesty or whatever. I I, I think he really wants that much power. Unfortunately. Yeah. yeah, and I wonder I wonder what institutional constraints there would be in practice. And then they talked about this, and let's talk about this because you've actually been the only candidate running for president that has consistently been skeptical of one-size-fits-all government solutions oh, yeah. when it comes to COVID um, or, frankly, virus management generally. Um, and neither of the candidates have been consistent last night. And, and Joe Biden now apparently wants us to say lockdown forever. I don't even exactly <laughs> understand his position. You like the bugs in our studio. Oh, right? <laughs> it's, uh, it must still be summer here. Yeah. Washington, the swamp. But, oh, uh, yes. <laughs> but the, I don't even ask you a question there. But so what what would have been the appropriate response if you were president to COVID-19? Well, the first one is to get rid of the FDA uh, obstacles to getting the testing out there. Uh, now, let me point out, if I had been in Trump's position, the FDA obstacles would have been gone years earlier. But had I not gotten around to it yet, that would have been the first thing. And because we needed testing. How do we know who can go out and who can stay home? And the second problem was he stood there on the stage with Dr. Fauci and said, if you don't have symptoms, don't get tested. And my jaw dropped because I had just seen the survey that said something like at the time they were saying something like 70 percent of the people. And I, I know the number changes, but at the time, something like 70 percent of the people with the virus show no symptoms. So doesn't that mean that you want to test more people because you could have it and be spreading it? And, and this was early on when we didn't know that much about the virus. So I think we need to do testing. And if you look at Southeast Asia where they were able to test, uh, they got ahead of the virus and they didn't have to shut down. So there were dozens of testing kits we could have been using that the FDA and or the CDC blocked and said no. I think it was the World Health Organization, but I get confused because Dr. Fauci and yes. the CDC and the World Health Organization and other people that, that speak for the Trump administration, they've taken virtually every position imaginable on masks, for instance. And Oh, and, you're, and, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, at first, oh, don't wear a mask. It, you know, you're just making yourself feel better. Yep. Right. And Fauci himself said that. And and I think the World Health Organization still has that position, but they, they could change any day because, <laughs> right. because the, the point is like we've politicized science, we've politicized healthcare, and what they're telling us is based on some political consideration instead of what actually might help us to do that. So your point about, about private innovation seems utterly appropriate here. Let's, uh, let's figure this out for ourselves because I don't trust our leaders. Yep. I don't even trust them to, us to tell us the truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But did you happen to see <laughs> this uh, this this video recently of the the mom watching her son's football game yes. in Ohio? And yes. and she wasn't wearing a mask and apparently she was asthmatic so she mm -hmm. she couldn't and and appropriately wasn't. Mm -hmm. And and the cop comes up and starts dragging her away and tases her. It seems like that's a cautionary story about police violence. Well, except, for conservative friends. <clears throat> well, except here's how I saw liberal media spun it. They showed the clip, and then they had a doctor on, 
And they said, so she had asthma. She doesn't have to wear a mask, right? And the doctor said, oh, no, everybody who has asthma can easily, can, you know, he didn't say everybody. It was something like 95%, you know, people with asthma can easily control it. And so there should be no, so, so they, basically they've got a doctor saying, nope, nope, you know, she should have been wearing a mask. Oh. But, but, but the point is, is that she and 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 you can see on the thing she's away from everybody and they're saying six feet i mean this was like six feet and then another six feet and then then another six feet there was no one close which and i gotta admit i i you know i did catch some of the um debate last night which i wanted to watch the whole thing but i only caught some of it i gotta admit i do agree with Trump that it's ridiculous how Biden makes sure he wears a mask even when you know, he's a mile away from anybody. I, I, like, the <laughs> ad you're describing, by the way, um, exposes him because I thought the most virtuous among us wore a mask 24-7, like when we sleep, in the shower, <laughs> when we're driving alone in our cars. Um, oh, that drives me nuts when I see people. <laughs> it's, it's so silly, but uh, it really but yeah, is. it's like he's he's putting on a show. Oh, yeah. And oh, yeah. And apparently that matters more than policy. Oh, yeah. And if you don't mind my bringing up that that Democratic convention was so stilted. And when he and Harris appeared on stage together for the very first time, they couldn't even get like, how about test each other? I mean, yeah. you know, you've you've got the money and the resources. You could get tested. You know, you, you could quarantine for 20. It's like it, you. It, obviously a show, but but a very awkward show. So yeah. I'm I'm at least glad it came off awkwardly. I'm I'm glad that uh, they didn't pull it off. Although yeah. it'd be really hard to pull that one off because it is so awkward. It's so silly. So they they argued about the Supreme Court, of course. Yes. And, and oh, and can, can I interrupt you there? Sure. Because and and here's where I, I here's where I caught part of it too, is and and and. Again, our TV wasn't working. I was having to watch it on just, you know, a little screen. And they asked Trump about why he chose this person. And so he starts defending her, right? And my immediate reaction is, you know what? I've been out of the news cycle for a couple of days because I've been sick. And so I, I hadn't heard the Democrat response to it, right? Right. But as Trump is talking about it, I immediately think, you know what? I know no matter who she is, Biden's going to be against her. And I thought, isn't that so sad? Because it's, you know, this very well could have been somebody that he would have chosen. Yeah. But, oh, because Biden chooses her, then Trump wouldn't like her. And I thought, you know what? He's going to find some reason to not like her. Yeah. And I asked uh, a friend of mine who's a lawyer about this, and he was pointing out that in the olden days, you would have like, 96 in favor of a Supreme Court justice and four against or two against. like it was always single digits that pretty much everybody said yep impartial you know check and now it doesn't matter who you bring up the other side's going to say no it's just so politicized yeah and it's kind of like the fight for the presidency which has grown increasingly partisan and hostile and I I have a theory yes. about this it's that those nine men and women in their black robes um, uh, wield extraordinary power over the rest of mm -hmm. us. And so what used to be a simpler job, and, and they, they didn't always do it well, but the, mm -hmm. the job of the Supreme Court was to defend the Constitution and make sure that the other two branches of government didn't cross the line. Um, they don't do that very well, and they've started legislating from the bench and all of the things that, that we worry it about. Exactly. And and when I asked my um, lawyer friend about it, that's what he said. Basically, what we've got now is we've got them appointing nine more Congress members yep. is, is what's going on. And, and that's the problem. So, yeah, we're no longer looking for impartial judges. Now we're picking Democrats versus Republicans. That's, again, that strays so far from what our founding fathers wanted, strays so far from the Constitution. There, you know, three branches of government, which AOC maybe by now understands. <laughs> um, and one of them is the legislative branch and the, ju the judicial is judicial, not legislative. Yeah. But now it's like we've got legislative one and legislative two, yeah. you know, just one has a lot more people. <laughs> and the other one only has nine. <laughs> this is the, 
I think this drives a lot of these divisions that are trumped up by the media. They're trumped up by the political parties. Mm -hmm. They want to divide us and they want to they want to make us think that we're not in, all in this together. And I I feel like and and let's wrap up with this because we got to get we got to get going to our next event. But I feel yes. like libertarians <clears throat> have a different idea. We we actually have a, this positive vision of how we might actually get along. Do you think so? Gee, you think? <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? This is the key that uh, people don't realize is they call, you know, uh, uh, pie in the sky. The fact that, oh, you think we're all just going to get along? No. I mean, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs hated each other. And that's why we've got such awesome cell phones and awesome computers, because they were trying to outdo each other. It's like we don't have to get along. We just have to be able to, you know, be civilized and then have police courts and military to basically have the rules. So we don't have to like each other. In fact, competition even helps if we hate each other a little bit. And all, you know, and, and, and we get the benefits of that. And instead, we've got, you know, instead of, you know, competitors fighting against each other for the best product, we've got politicians in Washington fighting each other to spend more of our money and make more of our decisions. So you are running for president, and mm -hmm. the Washington Post won't acknowledge that, and perhaps the Presidential Debate <laughs> Commission, controlled by Republicans and Democrats, mm -hmm. won't acknowledge that. But what's your pitch to voters who say, I'm told that voting third party is wasting my vote? Oh, that's a big question. First of all, I say voting for, voting for what you don't want is a wasted vote. And to Republicans, I say, you know what? I understand why you voted for Trump. You wanted an outsider. You wanted somebody. He said he was a businessman, going to come in, slash the deficit, slash the debt. Um, if he's done that, <laughs> go ahead and vote for him. And But we all know he hasn't. And I say, especially if you're in a solidly red state, um, send him a message that, hey, we sent you there as an outsider. Start acting like an outsider. Vote libertarian to send a message. And if you're in a solidly blue state and you're a Democrat, then I would say, you know what? The, the Democratic Party I know that I grew up in the 60s with is anti-war. They're pro-individual, pro-free speech. And the Democratic Party looks nothing like that. And if you really want an anti-war voice, um, vote for me. And by the way, the uh, Democratic machine uh, muzzled Tulsi Gabbard, kept her off the stage. So yeah, what do, do you want war hawk book Joe Biden or do you want peace? Like, why are you a Democrat? But just in general, you know, there are 40 million Americans who do lean libertarian, who do think that we should be able to make our own choices and not have the people in Washington make those choices for us. And if everybody just voted the way they really wanted, I could win in a landslide. And what I've been telling people is don't vote for me to cast a vote for me. Vote for me to cast a vote for you because you know best what you need. You know best how to spend your money. You know best how to, you know, prioritize your family needs. So give a vote for yourself. Love it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, Thank uh, you. and skull. Skull. Awesome bourbon, by the way. Thanks. It's beautiful. Thanks for watching Kibbe on Liberty. By now, you know this is the most important event of your week. So make sure you subscribe on YouTube, click the little bell so you get notifications. Kibbe on Liberty, mostly honest conversations with mostly interesting people.